Today I'm turning Pokemon into Digimon and Digimon into Pokemon. Both are Japanese franchises about forcing your mildly occultic super pets to punch each other with magic until Charles Darwin turns over in his grave and they experience a few million years worth of evolution on the spot. So it's no wonder they've spent the entirety of Ted Kaczynski's jail term being compared to one another. Both have games, cards, cartoons, and they even share a surname. But what sets the digital monster apart from its pocket counterpart? Well I see no better way to demonstrate their differences than by exploring exploring how these two factions of merchandisable monstrosities would look in each other's art styles. So to paraphrase one respected elder stateswoman, let's Pokemon go. Coming to you from beautiful downtown Fortitude Valley, it's the Harry Gold Show, with your host, Harry Gold. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the program. Now history is replete with corporate rivalries. Pepsi versus Coke, Marvel versus DC, Twitter versus all the people who keep swearing that Elon's gone too far, and they're totally definitely moving to a different platform for really real this time. So it only stands to reason that the most lucrative multimedia juggernaut on this big wet gobstopper we call Earth might find its style occasionally bitten. So I'm here to help it bite back. Seeing as there is one character between these franchises combined that even the most aggressively out of touch, pop culture immune baby boomer in your family can name, let's start by digitizing THE Pokemon himself, Pikachu. From a character design perspective, the number one thing that screams Digimon to me is those taxidermied looking eyes. While Pokepeepers tend to be quite variable and simplistic, the majority of Digimon have caught a bad case of anime eye. Always wash your hands after touching raw Japanese culture, or it can happen to you too. In fact, some have such a chronic case that it's overtaken the whites of their eyes completely, leaving them looking like what might happen if your favourite discount cosmetics brand decided to shift its animal testing from rabbits to fish. Regardless, Digimon eyes are typically almond shaped, with nearly RuPaulian eyelash bulk and more glassy anime shine spots than you can shake a body pillow at. Meanwhile, careening down the other side of this aesthetic superhighway, let's try dragging Agumon, that most quintessential of Digimon's denizens, kicking and screaming into the cheerfully uptight world of Nintendo. Rather counterintuitively, as he is normally, this crusty little wad of cheddar-tinted shoe leather is at once too complicated and too simple to be a Pokemon. On the one desperately manicure-starved hand, comprising a creature of almost all one uninterrupted surface in a single colour is much more simplistic than you would typically see on a Pokemon these days. Even back when hardware limitations lumped the big N with a near microbial resolution and the chromatic diversity of an unboxed colouring book, being as simple as Agumon was still pretty unusual. But on the other hand, those pocket type monsters tend to be sleeker and more streamlined than their digitoid counterparts. Smoother, rounder, with little to no visible musculature. Relatable. But before we continue, this episode of The Harry Gold Show was brought to you by Displate. <sighs> What's he so torn up about? Our owner. Former owner. Just discovered Displate. While paper posters like us rip and crease, Displate posters are made of metal. Can't compete with that. Now we're just garbage. Oi, my mother was garbage. Worse yet, their catalogue has over two million artworks to choose from, designs by thousands of independent creators across the globe, and thousands more officially licensed designs of everyone's favourite characters. Superman. Yep. Snoopy. Yep. Frida Kahlo. Yep. Blimey, they're good. They're depressingly quick and easy to put up, too. Yes, Displates come with a magnet that sticks to your wall. No nails or tools or holes. Just put your plate on the magnet and swap it out any time you like. Lucky blighters. Worst of all, they're launching a new product line called Display Texture, a premium print finish with textures, gloss effects, and 3D depth. Now available on hundreds of best-selling displates with more releasing in the coming months. Look on the bright side, fellas. At least being out here beats lining a birdcage. Use the discount link in the description, or our code the Harry Gold Show at checkout, to get 22% off one to two displates, or 30% off three or more. Display Prints on metal. Now, pinning down precisely what constitutes the Pokemon art style is trickier than you might expect, because it's evolved so much over time. That's like irony or something? Even after Bill Clinton left office and took the Pokemon company's watercolor set with him, the character design philosophy in the post-digital art era has evolved... Shut up. Uh, has transformed over the years as well. While the aforementioned Game Boy induced plainness was a definite factor back in the beige electronics days, at the same time fiddly details were quite fashionable among these poke pioneers. Newer additions to Game Freak's overstuffed bestiary tend to lean towards an approach that is even sleeker still. This is perhaps most noticeable in newer variations on older Pokemon, such as the Grimer that's become Poison Slash Dark type, or the Vulpix whose type is Ice Slash Ozempic. 
Digimon, by way of contrast, are just kinda lumpy. As the 90s style quasi-edgy virtual pet for boys, they set themselves apart from Tamagotchi's roster of sappy Sanrio wannabes with a veritable cornucopia of implied violence. Jagged fangs with bared gums, large dagger-like claws, copious spikes, and those single ear piercings that never really looked good on anyone without a peg leg. Anything to look more grisly and gruesome than Team Pikachu would ever allow. These guys also came equipped with more muscles, scragglier hair, and bigger hands and feet. Not to mention oodles of wrinkles, veins, pockmarks, and everything else Hollywood spends the GDP of a small empire getting rid of. Interestingly, Digimon's slightly more stylized, abstract approach to adapting real-world things into monsters is more in line with where Pokemon was in its earliest days. For example, compare the relatively representational primates of more recent entries in the series to 1996's Round Angry Cat with a Pig Snout. The original mole was a clown nose stuck on a half-buried salami, and the kangaroo looks like Godzilla was roped last minute into group cosplaying the cast of Winnie the Pooh. Missing body parts were par for the course, and recognizability was entirely optional. There would have been a real safe space for AI artists. Oddly, these triangular eyes with the gaps in the outline were everywhere in the first generation, an endangered species by the second, and downtown Nowheresville by the third. I couldn't possibly say why, maybe they made dealing with the fill tool too much of a pain, who knows. But regardless, this is an interesting example of something that's technically completely within the realms of the Pokemon art style, as Pokemon featuring them still appear in the modern games, but would probably look out of place if one were to see it in a new design. The way both franchises design their monsters isn't just different individually, they're different on a collective level as well. That's right, it's time for Poke Communism. <laughs> Digimon and Pokemon share the Kafka-esque habit of spontaneously mutating into an entirely new creature, but each franchise handles this Cronenbergian nightmare a little differently. Digimon's baby forms, for instance, tend to be exceedingly simple and very much in line with the Robespierre school of character design. That being, some heads are better off without a body. This particular design choice isn't that noteworthy in and of itself. There are, of course, plenty of Pokemon that fit the sentient Squishmallow genre. It's only when we look at how they evolve, or Digivolve if you prefer Bandai's McNugget-esque brand jargon, that this aesthetic connectivity begins to fray. Most Pokemon tend to develop along fairly straightforward lines. The smaller dog grows up to be the bigger dog, the smaller Minecraft grows up to be the bigger Minecraft, so on and so forth. Even the ones that don't just go up a couple of shirt sizes still mirror real-world metamorphosis. Seed becomes flower, caterpillar becomes butterfly, Donald Trump becomes Donald Trump with a bit of his ear missing, stuff like that. Even at their most outlandish, Pokemon typically only take taxonomic sidesteps. From seagull to pelican, piranha to shark, lily pad to... Mexican? What did Game Freak mean by this? Digimon, all the while, go wherever the heck they darn well please. Sometimes the small plant will grow into a bigger plant. Other times, the ghost becomes a hamster bat, which turns into biblically accurate Robocop. All this to say, while Agumon's baby form, Koromon, could fairly easily be tweaked to fit the Pokemon vibe in a vacuum, only Digimon's rules allow for a disembodied rabbit head to transform into Jurassic Park Jr. A dinosaur under Nintendo's strict supervision will forever remain precisely that, and whatever carnivorous race of marshmallow Koromon belongs to would notice stay in its lane. That said, if I threw out every line of Digimon that made no blinking sense, this video would be right at home in an old Vine compilation. So the best I can do to claw some cohesion back into this sucker's inexplicable family tree is to give it legs. And Nyaromon here faces much the same issue. Though it's considerably more cat-like than Koromon is reptilian, a rudder-headed cheese dumpling like this would almost certainly never wind up as a fully formed feline Pokemon. Heck, just missing a nose is only one Meowth away from being disqualified, let alone a full abdominal amputation. While there are some small mammal Pokemon who sprout a couple of extra limbs when they go through puberty, and you thought acne was bad, the only way you'd see one grow a whole new creature from nothing but a head is if the next Detective Pikachu was directed by John Carpenter. All that said, evolution between the two series features not just different qualities, but different quantities as well. Digimon often grow up to take on a second baby form, sort of like humans that use the word adulting. Despite looking like H. Geiger's Pitch for a Bug's Life sequel, Tentamon's baby form looks less creepy crawly and more like Hamtaro knocked up a Pac-Man ghost. You reckon it's legal to pay child support in sunflower seeds? To make Tentamon's incoherent genealogy even halfway compatible with the Game Freak ethos, I've skipped over Motomon entirely and jumped straight to its baby form, which almost looks like some kind of bug lava if you squint. 
well, drunk and concussed. Conversely, Pokemon are incapable of evolving properly more than twice, making three the highest possible grand total of stages in an individual monster's life. Does that make this a punk phase or a midlife crisis? While this rule difference means culling the evolutionary line down to three for our pocketized Digimon, we have to cut extra forms from whole cloth for our digitized Pokemon. Come to think of it, isn't it strange that pocket monsters shortens to Pokemon? That'd be like shortening digital monsters to Digimon. Anyhow, because Digimon are so much more flexible on this front, our Pikachu Mon needs a baby form for its baby form. What would you call that? A fetal form? A zygote form? A bluey fan form? Anyhow, the average Digimon line doesn't stop there. On top of having multiple babies prior to adolescence, now there's a sentence you wouldn't want to hear in any other context, they can also transform any number of times beyond it. Crashing through Pokemon's makeover ceiling isn't the only design rule they're liable to break either. For instance, Pokemon generally don't carry weapons. The few that do typically use something found in nature, like like a bone, or a log, or a spoon. Digimon have no problem wielding weaponry that is out of the question for a Pokemon. Except when it isn't. See, the big catch to the rules of Pokemon design is we civilians don't actually know what they are. All we can do is confidently proclaim the certainty of patterns we've identified and then look like an idiot when Nintendo changes its mind. Now that is just a lady. Well, a few feathers more than just a lady, but you know what I mean. The more evolved Digimon get, the more anthropomorphized and less organic looking they tend to become. Which is why this series is replete with knockoff Evangelions and back to front Animorphs. While there are Pokemon that resemble stylized human beings, none of them go that far. Not that that seems to be much of a deterrent for the fanbase. That's why we really need to guard the devoir on Angemon's creatively named female counterpart. I hope whoever approved Ange Woman was fired. Preferably into the sun. Digimon are also entirely capable of coming into existence already wearing clothes. It's a good thing they hatch from eggs. Live birth with all those belt buckles would not be fun for mom. Meanwhile, when Pokemon are not in a state of E for everyone compliant nudity, they'll be designed to resemble a clothed creature, rather than stalking through tall grass in the latest from Lululemon. There is something of an imbalance between the two camps when it comes to cuteness, too. While Digimon are capable of being just as saccharine and plush ready as any Pokemon, evolved Digimon that aren't turning into unfortunate fanfic bait tend to be far more gruesome and finicky than Nintendo's side of the fence could ever sanction. Carbuterimon here is a prime example, and needs to be slimmed down and dolled up before it could ever stand plausibly among the Pokemon Company's finest. I mentioned before that there is something of a coherence gap between how Pokemon and Digimon conduct themselves during their Darwinian fast tracking. The peculiar thing about Digimon is sometimes even after a whole succession of cogent designs, they'll just abruptly turn into a completely unrelated creature altogether. On top of the way characters are designed, the primary illustration styles themselves are obviously also very different between the two franchises. Pokemon's official art look has actually evolved changed considerably over time, even since the Electric Mouse House's poker portraitists made the move from washers to washed out. But there are still a few standardized features to note. For instance, their outlines are quite thin and pretty rough around the edges, like the plot of a Mad Max film, but without the terrible Australian acting. It also has a simplified palette of block colors and a semi-transparent strip along the edges of its toon-style shading. In earlier generations, the colors tended to be quite desaturated. Relatable. While more recent designs have been livelier in hue, I sometimes keep my designs a bit faded anyway, as I find that that helps it read as authentic. In fact, the only thing that could be more authentically Pokemon would be releasing this video twice on the same day and expecting people to pay for both. The Digimon illustrations, on the flip side, have more of a comic book style approach. Oodles of hatching, harsh black shadows, and insipid airbrushed shading, making it appear grungier and more dynamic overall. It fits the general aesthetic contrast between the two quite well. Even though they may all call themselves monsters, you're about as likely to find Raemon in a safari zone as you are to find Cookie Monster in a Monster Hunter. You know, it's only really dawning on me now the goal of calling this franchise Digimon in the first place. At the peak of the Pokemon multimedia empire taking the world by storm, Bandai really swung in with their own set of video games, cards and anime series about evolving monsters and said, it's not copying, we only used half of your name. Imagine if Disney came out in 2002 with its own series of books and movies about British wizard children called Marvin Potter. I mean, jeez. Can you imagine what it would have been like if Digimon became the dominant monster accrual centric franchise instead? What a world that'd be. There'd be reverberations through culture, through politics. Can we get them to have Digimon go to the polls. Even here on YouTube, instead of the spate of Poketubers making Pokemon content we have now, this website would be overrun by Digitubers instead.
Hey guys, Ron here, and we're back at it again for part 113 of my series where I create new Digimon designs for a single evolutionary line. Check out the rest of the series if you haven't already, and consider leaving a like if you want to see a potential part 114. After all, this project is nearly halfway finished. Let's play a game. I'll draw someone famous, and three people that guess who it is in the comments will get a shout out in the next episode. If your guess for the caricature last time was the actor Christopher Eccleston, you are absolutely correct. Chris's rule from the Wheel of Winners is... The first three guesses to be completely grammatically correct and typo-free. Now, I'm not much of a grammar expert myself, but according to multiple automated grammar checkers, Victor Wongwajarachot lived up to his name, becoming the victor of this very competition. But the Raven was flying high, easily swooping into second place. And Joseph GM certainly mastered this game, clinching third. Well done, everyone. Thanks for playing. The subject of this episode's caricature has a small button nose. So small, in fact, that they needed a microscope just to do their own COVID swab. Their large, wide-set eyes are somewhat reminiscent of an owl's, if an owl was capable of being in two different hemispheres at once. And finally, this person's face is sort of short and wide with a towering forehead, as if their features all got sick of their usual spot's political climate and decided to emigrate chinward. Now who could this be? If you know who that was, let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, consider evolving into a subscriber. And thanks again to Displate for sponsoring this episode. But this has been the Harry Gold Show. So until next time, stay safe and God bless.